Hello and welcome back to Abstract Linear Algebra, the video course where we talk a lot about general abstract vector spaces. And indeed, in today's part 2, we will immediately look at some important examples for vector spaces. However, you might already know, first I want to thank all the nice people who support the channel on Steady, here on YouTube, on Patreon or by other means. And please don't forget, by supporting the channel you get access to all the additional material. For example, you can test your knowledge with exercises and quizzes. Ok, with that I would say we can immediately start by recalling the definition of a vector space. In fact, a very quick way to define it would be to say we have a set of vectors. We can visualize them with arrows, but please don't forget we could have very abstract objects for vectors. Therefore, the defining property is what we can do with these objects. And that's what we have discussed in the last video, we have the vector addition and the scalar multiplication. And there we have also learned that we need a field to scale vectors. And a field is just a set F where we have all the calculation rules we know from the numbers. Therefore, the two important cases for us will be that we either scale with real numbers or with complex numbers. However, please don't forget, also the rational numbers Q form a field. Ok, then let's go to some examples. The first example you should already know if you have watched my original linear algebra series. Namely, we want to consider the set of matrices with m rows and n columns. And if the entries can come from C, we write it as C to the power m times n. And there we already know how to add two matrices and how to scale one with a complex number. Hence, we immediately get a complex vector space. We say it's a complex vector space because the field for scaling is given by the complex numbers. Now, in order to prove that this is a vector space, you just have to check the 8 rules we have listed in the last video. And indeed, they are not so complicated, they just state the facts we expect from an addition and a scalar multiplication. And if you want to see more details of that for the matrices, you can check out our linear algebra series with part 11 and part 58. So you see, this example with the matrices is still very concrete, so let's go to a more abstract one. This is one of the most important ones, it's a vector space consisting of functions. And indeed, the domain of these functions is not so important, so we can fix any set i. And then we look at maps f that send this set i to the real number line. And now the idea is that we can put all these maps into one set and then we get a vector space by the definition above. And more precisely, this vector space we call curved f of i. As a set, this is easy to define because it's just a set of all these functions. So important to note here is that all these functions have the same domain, namely i. And again, what we get as a result is a real vector space. So this means we want to scale with real numbers, but the question is still what are the two operations addition and scalar multiplication in this case. Also, like for the matrices, in some sense these two operations are naturally given. So first let's start with the vector addition, so you have to know what the addition of two functions means. There I would argue that you don't have a problem with that, because you might have already seen that in other parts of mathematics. But still, let's write it down what it should mean. For this, let's look at the graph of a function, which means we have the abstract set i on the x-axis and on the y-axis we find r. Hence, for example, the graph of f could look like this. And then on the other hand, the graph of g could look like this. And then you should see, in order to define a new function f plus g, we could add the two values of the two functions at a given point and do that for every point. This means we just use vertical lines here and use the normal addition in the real numbers. So for example here, adding both values, we would land there. And this we can just repeat for every point we fix in i 
and then we get a new function as a graph. And indeed, this is all. This is how we can define f plus g as a new function from i into r. So formally, this means if you put in a point x from i, then you put it into f and g and add the two values. Therefore, please note, what we use here on the right hand side is the ordinary addition in the real number line. So this is something we know very well and we use it to define a new addition for this set. Ok, but in order to get a vector space for fi, you know we also need a scalar multiplication. And here it turns out, we can use the same trick again, because we already know we have a nice addition in r we can use. It means it should be possible to define a new function lambda times f. More concretely, it says take a function f from this set and a scalar from the real number line and then we can define a new function lambda times f. And how to do that, we can visualize in the graph again. Moreover, it also looks a little bit simpler because we only have one function f now. However, the idea is the same, we just fix a point in i and then we just scale the value of the function f at this point. So for example, if we scale here with a factor 2, we get this value at this point. And as before, we do that everywhere and then we get a new graph out. And indeed, this should be the graph of the function lambda times f. And formally, as before, we define this new function by saying what happens if we put in a point x. And then you already know, we get this value by putting x into the function f and scaling this value with the factor lambda. And please note again, this multiplication sign here is again the ordinary multiplication in the real number line. So we simply use it to define the abstract scalar multiplication here. And now the only thing that remains to show is if the 8 rules from the vector space definition are satisfied here. But this is not hard at all, because all these properties are inherited from the properties of the operations in the real number line. Therefore, in some sense it's just writing all the 8 rules down again, but it's a good exercise for you. And in the end, you definitely should remember this example of a vector space, because it occurs a lot in different branches in mathematics. Moreover, you should also see if we consider functions that are complex valued, we can make the same thing and get a complex vector space. Indeed, then it's also important that we scale with complex numbers, but otherwise all the definitions look the same. Ok, then I would say we are ready for the next example. This is one I will use a lot in this course of abstract linear algebra. Namely, it's the space of polynomials and often I will denote this set by curved P of R. And as before, what we put into the parentheses here, we can see as the domain of a function. Indeed, now we have polynomial functions. So we could say we have a lowercase p that maps R into R. And it's a polynomial function, which means only natural powers of x are allowed with coefficients. This means you could write p of x is given as a n x to the power n and then we have the power n minus 1 and this continues until we have the power 1 and 0. And there you already see, the only thing that is allowed here is the addition sign and scaling with coefficients. So we should not have a problem transforming this set into a vector space again. Indeed, if you see that this is a function again, Obviously, we can use the same operations as before. So we write, if we want to add two polynomials p1 and p2, we can use the same definition as before. And the same for the scalar multiplication with a scalar lambda. However, the crucial point here is that with these two definitions, we get a polynomial function again. Before, this was not a problem because we just needed a well-defined function and we got it with this definition. But now we need more, because the result should not just be a function, but a polynomial function. Nevertheless, we immediately recognize that this is not a problem at all, we have this fact. 
Therefore, the conclusion is, also here we have an abstract real vector space. Moreover, if you want and go to the complex numbers and you scale with the complex numbers, you can make it to a complex vector space as well. However, for the moment I would say, let's deal with the real vector spaces first. Okay, so now we have seen a very important fact here, namely P of R is a subset of F of R. So this is not so surprising, this is simply given by the definition of the sets. However, this subset relation is not all we have. Namely, since the vector space operations are exactly the same, we have a relation for vector spaces. And you might already know, this is exactly what we call a subspace. Or more precisely, we would say P of R is a linear subspace in F of R. So we have a well-defined vector space inside another bigger vector space. So the picture we could have in mind is that we have the large vector space F of R and inside, as a linear subspace, we find P of R. In particular, it means that they share the same zero vector. Therefore, for my side, the last question of the day is, what is this abstract zero vector? Of course, it has to be a function as well, because we live in a function space here. And now if you look at the operations here, you see it's also not so complicated, it has to be this zero function. This means it's the function that sends every point from the domain to zero. So please remember that this is our abstract zero vector in the function space or in the polynomial space. Okay, with that I would say let's discuss how we can define a linear subspace in this abstract setting in the next videos. So I really hope that I see you there and have a nice day. Bye bye.